Good morning. Thanks, Dr. Goldenberg. Um, so as uh, stated, I'm going to talk a little bit about male incontinence and urethral slings. Um, Post-prostatectomy incontinence has sort of been done as grand rounds a few times, so I just want to stick to a few specific uh, points of it. I want to go over a little bit the current understanding of the male sphincter, um, just look a little bit at the urodynamics of post-prostatectomy incontinence, and then uh, focus on male slings. So the retropubic bulbourethral slings, sort of where it all started. Um, Bone-anchored bulbourethral slings, and then the male TOT, um, some upcoming designs, and then uh, a little bit of a conclusion at the end. So urinary incontinence, of course, is due to uh, either or, um, or both uh, bladder pathology in the form of detrusor overactivity or poor bladder compliance or sphincteric uh, pathology. The male sphincter complex has undergone a bit of a change in uh, the understanding over time. Some of the challenges in understanding it initially, um, our initial understanding of the male sphincter was based on a small number of cadaveric studies. A lot of these were anatomic dissections in children and fetuses, which were applied to uh, adult patients. Um, terminology has always been confusing around the, uh, the um, various sphincters and the various names that have been assigned to them. And finally, the majority of the work was done in German, which uh, didn't help the uh, North American doctors too much. So the traditional understanding of the uh, male sphincter, we've got the uh, bladder neck, we've got the prostatic muscular stroma, and then we've got the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, sphincters. Um, near the uh, membranous urethra. This has been refined a little bit and understood a little bit better with a combination of better cadaveric dissections and urodynamic studies in uh, several different populations, which I'll go over briefly here. Uh, the male sphincter is best understood as two morphologically related but functionally unrelated components. So if we look at a little bit of a better uh, diagram here of the, uh, um, of the uh, male sphincter, you've got the bladder neck uh, or you've got the bladder muscle which is actually separate from the bladder neck uh, muscle, which you can see at number two there. That forms the bladder um, neck smooth muscle sphincter. And this sphincter is basically the entire smooth muscle sphincter that envelops the um, length of the urethra down to the membranous urethra. Um, the second uh, sphincter is basically the um, external uh, rhabdo sphincter, which you can see is concentrated primarily at the uh, membranous urethra and then wraps around the anterior portion of the uh, prostatic uh, of the prostate and prostatic urethra. So there are a few anatomic concepts that have sort of been refined in the understanding of the male sphincter. Um, tapering, so if you look at the uh, diagram to the left there, the smooth muscle sphincter is concentrated most at the bladder neck and then tapers down uh, as you reach the membranous urethra. The rhabdo sphincter uh, tapers in the opposite direction, is concentrated primarily at the membranous urethra and then uh, has a component uh, anterior to the uh, prostate. Completeness is a second uh, concept that uh, comes up. So the smooth muscle sphincter is actually circular and envelops the entire uh, urethra, whereas the rhabdo sphincter actually posteriorly um, has a, a central raphae or fibrous, or fibrous portion um, that forms a, an anchoring band for the uh, rhabdo sphincter. And finally, atrophy. So the smooth muscle sphincter stays constant throughout life, whereas the uh, prostatic portion of the uh, rhabdo sphincter tends to atrophy with age. Yes. Yes. Uh, good question. I didn't get into that too much with um, with these rounds. I mean, I think clinically it hasn't. Oh, sorry. The question was: uh, given the picture, is there any advantage to bladder neck sparing surgery? And uh, I guess the main, which I'm going to get to in a few minutes, the main determinant of continence is the length of um, the functional length of smooth muscle. Um, sphincter that's left. So in theory, if you can, by bladder neck sparing, preserve or elongate the length of smooth muscle that's left, then uh, yes, theoretically, that would make a difference. I think clinically, uh, bladder neck sparing hasn't really panned out as, uh, as changing incontinence rates uh, too much. So what do we understand physiologically about the male sphincter? Well, the smooth muscle sphincter is uh, thought to be primarily the um, the primary control of passive continence. So if we look at a couple different populations of patients and their various uh, uh, VCUGs or um, video urodynamics, we can sort of uh, figure out uh, physiologically how the male sphincter works. Normal patients, they hold their urine at the bladder neck, um, of course, uh, due to the bladder neck uh, component of the smooth muscle sphincter. After a TERP, the urine is actually held at the resection limit where the smooth muscle is intact. And that's actually above the main component of the uh, of the rhabdo sphincter.
after a posterior urethroplasty, um, the, bladder's, uh, the, the bladder neck again holds the urine, which is what you'd expect because the external rhabdo sphincter is being resected. Now, the interesting one is post-radical prostatectomy incontinence. Um, so in this case, you resect too distal, you injure the smooth muscle, but the external rhabdo sphincter is still generally intact, and that's been uh, um, suggested with uh, uh, maximal urethral closure pressure profiles, um, which, are, which still demonstrate a functional external uh, rhabdo sphincter. Finally, continence is maintained after curare injections into the rhabdo sphincter or uh, pudendal nerve blocks, which is one of the innervations of the, uh, of the rhabdo sphincter. So this sort of suggests that, smooth, that the smooth muscle sphincter is the primary continence mechanism uh, for males. It's also redundant. Uh, that's why we can get away with a lot of what we do um, surgically in urology. The circular muscle fibers create maximal closure of the urethra at two points. One is at the bladder neck, where the vast the majority of the muscle uh, is located. And the second one is at the membranous urethra, where the urethra is actually thinnest and easiest to uh, co-opt. So what does the rhabdo sphincter do? Well, it's thought that it provides primarily active continence in the male. So contraction moves the anterior urethral wall against a rigid posterior plate, which is composed of denovilliers and rectal urethralis. And this is important uh, when we get to uh, the function of some of the slings and how they might be working. Um, the prostatic portion of the rhabdo sphincter is thought to be more important for uh, ejaculation than for continence. So you can correlate this with urodynamic mm -hmm. studies and uh, really try to understand the function of the, uh, of the sphincters. Again, this is in the same multiple sets of populations, so post-terp, post-urethroplasty, uh, post-radical prostatectomy incontinence, um, which sort of give us a look at when different segments of the uh, sphincter is being resected. The conclusions are that continence is a function of primarily the smooth muscle sphincter. An intact rhabdo sphincter doesn't guarantee continence. A deficient rhabdo sphincter doesn't produce incontinence if you have an intact smooth muscle sphincter. And a smooth muscle sphincter can be shortened up to half of its normal length to maintain continence. So up to uh, uh, 1.5 centimeters uh, needs to be maintained generally. So we'll talk a little bit about post-prostatectomy incontinence. Uh, Dr. McLaughlin? How much of the smooth muscle is in the prostate? Good question. Yeah. You need about half of it, which is about what you take in a uh, in a radical prostatectomy. So the prostate, the prostate only has, one third of the smooth muscle. has about half of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I mean that's really yeah that's really where you you get to the the importance of developing a good apex for the uh, the radical prostatectomy probably for continence. Um, so looking at post-prostatectomy incontinence, there's been lots of studies looking at the rates. The main point of this slide was simply to, uh, to demonstrate the fact that a uh, physician um, questioned uh, reporting of incontinence probably isn't as accurate as we'd like to think. Um, when you look at uh, patients with anonymous questionnaires, they do tend to report a higher level of incontinence. There's probably an element of uh, trying to please their surgeon in, uh, in the uh, assessment there. We know about 8 to 12 percent of patients will have uh, enough leakage after radical prostatectomy to want to seek treatment for stress urinary incontinence. And we also, uh, it's been fairly well demonstrated that this urinary incontinence has significant detrimental effects on their health-related quality of life. Points of injury intraoperatively, obviously damage to the neurovascular bundles, uh, dissection of the tips of the SVs and damage to the pelvic plexus, and then finally direct injury to the uh, sphincter muscle or fascial tissues around there. That can either be to the actual sphincter, to the sphincteric supports, or um, neuronal injury uh, closer to the sphincter. Yes? Is evidence that damage to the neurovascular bundle affects No, sorry, that's, uh, this is better thought as of um, uh, theories as to why you get post-prostatectomy incontinence. Because, I mean, really the cavernosal nerve shouldn't, uh, shouldn't provide much uh, in terms of uh, innervation. Yeah, I think you've got to make that clear. There's no link yeah. between neurovascular bundle. But exactly. But if you get a little bastard, I'm not going to look at the two, that's a possibility. People up to the apex, way more aggressive. I think that's what Walsh was saying. They say, well, nerve sparing, prostatectomy is, if you've got a problem, it was the association, I think it was a technique, not a nerve,
So looking at urodynamic studies of post-prostatectomy incontinence, it's multifactorial, obviously. There's an element of both bladder and sphincteric pathology. Um, the truser instability has been found in uh, about a fifth to a third of patients. Uh, there's been variable reports of bladder compliance, uh, bladder sensation, and bladder contractility being impaired. Um, intrinsic sphincter dysfunction is the primary uh, urodynamic diagnosis in the majority of these patients. Um, and finally, anatomic considerations such as a bladder neck contracture. So the question is, of course, are these changes a consequence of surgery or are they actually uh, just being unmasked um, due to long-term bladder outlet obstruction or age-related changes? Often the changes are asymptomatic and only detected on urodynamic studies. This was a good review article looking at all the various studies uh, doing urodynamics in the post-prostatectomy incontinence patients. Um, the main things to note are um, the truser overactivity is present in a variety of patients, and obviously these are a variety of studies with a variety of definitions. Um, the truser uh, or reduced bladder compliance is present in about 10 to 20 percent, and stress incontinence, as demonstrated on urodynamics, uh, is present in anywhere from 8 to 70 percent of patients. So why is bladder compliance change? Well, perivascular inflammation or fibrosis after surgery alterations of the bladder wall geometry, um, disruption of the innervation of the detrusor, detrusor overactivity, again, vesicle urethral reflux, uh, post-surgical changes to the bladder, and recruitment of new spinal circuits in patients with bladder outlet obstruction, which has actually been uh, demonstrated in neuroplasticity models in rats. So this is another table from that same review paper. The main thing to note here is the impaired detrusor contractility. You can see anywhere from sort of 25 to 40 percent of patients in the three studies that looked at this did show some impaired detrusor contractility, which again will be important when considering uh, patients for male slings. There's some evidence that urodynamics may help predict post-op uh, radical prostatectomy incontinence. This was a paper published in 94 looking at uh, patients with pre- and post-op urodynamic studies. Uh, a third of patients had some sort of pre-existing pathology, primarily uh, bladder pathology. Um, and in these, in this group of patients, they had a much higher rate of stress urinary incontinence versus those with normal urodynamics. So looking at the uh, conclusions here, about half the patients with post-prostatectomy incontinence will have the sole diagnosis of um, ISD. About 10 to 15 percent will have uh, primarily detrusor dysfunction and the remainder will have a combination of both. Um, compliance and contractility will be a new finding as uh, a new pathological finding in about uh, um, 30 percent of patients uh, after surgery and in about uh, 50 percent of these it's new and in about 50 percent of these it resolves after about eight months. So who generally gets treatment for post-prostatectomy incontinence? Well we know that the, uh, the curve of recovery for urinary function sort of starts to plateau after 12 to 24 months. So generally stress urinary incontinence that is persistent and bothersome despite 12 months of active conservative treatment Conservative treatment being uh, fluid restriction, medical management of any bladder pathology, pelvic floor exercises. So we know pre-op Kegels help uh, return of incontinence post-op. Uh, the role primarily post-op is, uh, isn't well defined. And then periurethral bulking agents, which have generally fallen out of favor. Their one-year success rate is around 5 to 10 percent, so they've largely been abandoned. So you decide someone failed conservative treatment. What are the options? Well, there's leaky treatment option number one. You've got uh, various things designed to try to uh, either catch the urine, um, such as the contraption on the right there, uh, various pads. Then uh, there's the geezer squeezer clip that you can buy online for 19.95. There is a uh, a little. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's the trade name though, so I got to show it up. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, the uh, the little sling there actually comes in three sizes, and somehow on the internet site, uh, the extra large was the only one they were sold out of. <laughs> Leaky treatment option number two, the uh, AUS uh, is the uh, the second option, and these have been the two mainstays of uh, treatment for uh, for patients with post prostatectomy incontinence. So a little bit about the. Uh, the artificial urinary sphincter, again, we've done rounds on this before, so just one slide on this. It's um, had a high level of success across all levels of incontinence for 30 years. Success rates range from 75 to 90 percent. Long-term follow-ups available. The largest series out of Mayo was 320 patients. Um, 
at six year follow up they had about 90 percent uh, dry rate uh, some of the complications of the sphincter there's a revision rate which is the uh, the main problem with the sphincter about 15 to 20 percent at five years for various uh, for various reasons there's a mechanical failure rate with it there's an infection rate going in and there is a risk of, uh, of erosion so what about a third option the male sling so the goal of the male sling is to apply sufficient uh, urethro-occlusive pressure to prevent leakage, but to allow normal voiding with a detrusor contraction. So it's designed, and the reason people are interested in it is to overcome some of the disadvantages of the artificial urinary sphincter, such as infection rate, um, urethral erosion. Uh, in theory, the, uh, any sling should put pressure only on the uh, ventral portion of the urethra, should spare the dorsal urethra. It's not circumferential, so it shouldn't uh, interfere with venous blood flow to the urethra and should, in theory, have lower erosion rates. Need for device manipulation, which is one of the big problems with the, uh, with the AUS. It uh, gives people with poor hand coordination and people who are a little bit bigger and can't work the pump properly um, another option. Expense, it should, in theory, be uh, cheaper than the AUS. It allows physiological voiding. So, in other words, you want to pee, you go to the bathroom and you pee and there should be a reduced risk for further surgery because it shouldn't need uh, revisions like the artificial urinary sphincter does. So what are some general principles for the male sling? It needs adequate tension. You need to use a well-designed synthetic material. Attempts to do slings in males with uh, cadaveric fascia or autologous fascia have all uh, uniformly failed over time. This is because the uh, male sling is a little bit different in principle than the female sling. The female sling, of course, is tension-free. Whereas in the male sling, you need to maintain this tension. As soon as you lose this tension, uh, you lose your confidence. And you need to be able to fix the sling adequately. Again, any slippage of the sling uh, will uh, result in return of the stress urinary incontinence.